I'm Peter Shad. It's great to have you along. You know, not everybody uh, views the upcoming holidays the way I do. Magical, joyous, filled with excitement and anticipation. In fact, you and I could probably name several people who, for one reason or the other, loathe the holidays and can't wait for them to be over. Why do some of us feel so helpless, hopeless, and generally gloomy at this time of year? More importantly, what can we do to change that? Here to talk about seasonal affective disorder is one of our most popular experts and a man who has devoted his life to unlocking the secrets and the power of the human brain. His impressive resume includes heading up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa before moving on to Harvard, where he lectured for seven years before coming here. Since then, Dr. Paul Swingle has developed his Vancouver clinic into one of the leaders in the field of neurotherapy in North America. You're listening to CFUN's Experts on Call, and this is It's All in Your Head. Hello, Dr. Swingle. Good morning. So you have the least amount of daylight. You have more alcohol and family dynamics all playing mm -hmm. a part. It's a cocktail for disaster, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. We get a lot of folks who get severely depressed at this time of year. And part of the issue is to determine exactly what we're dealing with. Are we dealing with individuals who just get sad around the holidays because of oh, feelings of deprivation or whatever? Or are we dealing with an actual physiological condition, deprivation of light being a principal one? Or are we dealing with a major depressive episode that just happened to occur at this time of year? The uh, seasonal affective aspect of it is irrelevant. So trying to sort all of that out is important in the first instance to effectively treating these kinds of conditions. What we can do today is give the listeners some ideas of various things they can try. Now, I guess one of us uh, or several of us are predisposed mm -hmm. to depression, predisposed to seasonal affective disorder. And I guess your job as a neurotherapist is to figure out what type of depression this is, and that's apparently very easy for you to do, isn't it? Yes, what we do is do a uh, brain assessment and see what the brain is telling us. Uh, there are a number of different forms of depression. Each one has a particular brain signature. And if it's something like seasonal affective disorder, there are a lot of things that we can do and suggest for folks to do at home to correct those conditions. Seasonal affective disorder hits around this time of year, and it's very interesting if you look at the data. It affects between 4 and 6% of the population, which is huge, but it's directly related to latitude. Uh, in Florida, for example, the general rate is about 1.4%, and it increases to about 9.7% in the state of New Hampshire. So obviously Canada, we're up in that upper region. In Australia, it's an unknown disorder, 0.3% of the population in terms of the surveys are affected by seasonal affective disorder. So that tells us a huge amount. So I'm guessing a country like Finland, for example, or Iceland, would be pretty tough living. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, awful lot of glum folks walking around. You've helped so many people through so many issues, including depression. I, I'm guessing it's one of the issues that brings the most amount of people into your clinic. Yes, although very often people don't recognize it as depression. They'll come in with sleep disturbance, for example, or lack of energy, poor motivation. Even some physical conditions are associated with depressed mood state because it does affect the immune functioning. And it is a comorbid condition, meaning a related condition in a lot of circumstances. So yes, the answer to your question is yes, we see a huge number of folks with depression. Now, as always, we invite your phone calls and if you you know, feel as though you fall into this category of seasonal affective disorder, or for that matter, if you have any questions related to the brain or issues you may have. We had a very interesting show on fibromyalgia the last time you were here and had lots of phone calls about that. Let's talk a little bit about neurotherapy. It is still amazing to me how if you talk to somebody, uh, even somebody who knows a lot about uh, medicine and science, that they're still not really sure or have heard a whole lot about neurotherapy mm -hmm. and, and biofeedback. What exactly do you do at your clinic? Well, what we do is we have a look at the way the brain functions. The brain produces electrical signals when it's working, and we can measure that with the electroencephalogram, the EEG. A lot of folks are familiar with the EEG. What we do is do a brain map, and we're looking at how the brain is functioning. We're looking for areas of inefficiency in the way the brain is processing information. We can identify a huge number of disorders just from the patterning in the brain. And as you know from a lot of folks who call into this program, I don't ask a person why they've come to see me. 
what I do is a brain map and then tell them why they're there. It's that precise. Now, to correct that, we use what's called neurotherapy, and we have a lot of different procedures that are very naturalistic, non-invasive to nudge the brain towards more normative functioning. And we don't even realize it's <clears throat> happening while we're getting treated, I guess, as it were. The answer to that is yes. There are several ways that we can set this up. For example, if we're dealing with a young child who has, let's say, attention problems, we set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do, an icon moves across the computer screen. In other words, they play a computer game with their brain. The second treatment procedure is referred to as brain driving. There we measure a particular aspect of brain functioning. Based on that measurement, we stimulate with light, sound, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields, and so forth to nudge the brain into more normative functioning. Then we have a lot of home treatment procedures that people self-administer, things like harmonic sounds and so forth, that normalizes brain functioning. And the good news is once it's fixed, it's fixed. A good example of this is what the Italian soccer team did. There was an article in the Globe and Mail about the secret weapon of the Italian soccer team that won the World Cup, and what it was was neurotherapy. Every member on the team was treated to normalize and then optimize brain functioning. And you do a lot of that with uh, pro athletes who come in and they just want to sharpen up before a big event, especially in personalized sports, but that's a great example of a team sport where it worked well for all of them. Yes, yes, we do a, a lot of that. And the interesting thing about brain mapping is when you come in, it really takes only about six minutes or so, and basically you have the electrodes attached to the certain points in the head, and then you ask them to read, close their eyes, have their eyes open, all sorts of different steps, and then you judge from there on. That's right. Open and close your eyes, read something. We test a few things like harmonic sounds to see how the brain is reacting so we can get an idea of what to prescribe. The reason it's so precise is we test it before we prescribe it, and we see what it's doing to the brain. We prescribe it. But there's no guesswork associated with it. And I know you've heard from a lot of listeners who call back after having seen you who call it miracle work and they're so complimentary and they tell a lot of their friends about it. That must be awfully gratifying for you too to actually fix some of these chronic problems and some of these problems have lasted for years and years and years. Yes. Neurotherapy can correct a lot of conditions that are considered intractable by conventional medical and psychological practice. Our focus today is on seasonal affective disorder, SADS, and we're going to give you some tips, actually, on what you could do to help make it a little bit better. Before we talk about why medication is a danger in this area and why you don't recommend uh, medicating, let's take a phone call. Dave, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head here on CFUN 1410 AM. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, um, it seems over the last, I don't know, three or four years, um, just uh, more depressive um, lack of motivation, where it's super motivated. Um, yeah, just anxiety feeling. Um, I'm not wishing to tackle anything anymore. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Started to use alcohol as a uh, make me feel better temporarily, you know. Um, yes. That kind of thing. And where I know it's, you know, it's not me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this seasonal or? It seems to, it, it well, it, it, it never was seasonal. Mm -hmm. But it seems just over the last, I don't know, four years, it seems to be um, at times, um, yeah, if I'm not busy, you get down on yourself. Yeah, it gets worse. Yeah. Okay. It sounds to me as though you have a major depressive disorder that happens to get a bit worse at certain times of year. Yeah. What I would suggest here, among other things, is that you have a brain assessment to see what kind of depression we're dealing with here and then correct it at its source. Mm -hmm. There are some things that you can do. And the first is to recognize the conditions that are giving rise to the depressed mood state, and principally that's negative thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I call that cancer of the mind as opposed to cancer of the brain. No kidding, yeah. And if you use alcohol to correct this, I think you're well aware of the fact that if you have a negative thought, <clears throat> it just overwhelms you. And yeah. you're thinking about it over and over and over and over and over again, and it just pushes everything else out. Exactly. There are some things that you can do, and this is easier said than done, but if you're vigilant, you can make an important difference in your life, and that is to recognize when this cancer is starting to metastasize and to do things like replace that thought with some positive thoughts. 
And if you're a spiritual person, it can be offering a prayer of gratitude. If you're not a spiritual person, it can be thinking about some positive things that are going to take place during the day. There are a lot of things that you can do to change the way you're thinking about yourself because if you maintain the negative thought process, it spirals, it gets more intense, and it's just like cancer of the mind. It just spreads all over the place. Now, throughout the program, we're going to be talking about a lot of things that you can do at home mm -hmm. uh, in terms of various supplements and things of that nature. So as the program proceeds, you'll be getting some advice on some other things you can do. But anytime we're dealing with a major depressive disorder, we want to correct the neurology associated with it. And the one thing you want to avoid is the use of uh, simply medicating it. And your use of alcohol, of course, is exactly what you're trying to do with that. And, of course, other kinds of antidepressant medications. Dave, the good news is it's actually very easy to fix for a Dr. Swingle. And the other good news is that you are certainly not alone in the way you feel. I mean, how many people sound just like what Dave says? It describes exactly how they feel. Thanks for your call, David. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we were talking about medication and medicating. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is it so bad or not a good idea to do what Dave said, and that's to rely on antidepressants? Well, the first issue is that antidepressant use increases the prevalence and duration of depressive episodes. There's pretty compelling evidence for that. Sickness increases, sickness absence increase, the frequency of depressive episodes increase, and the duration of any particular episode increases with the use of antidepressants. Now, that's quite opposite of the way that we think about it. By the way, that's Canadian data on a big survey that was done in Toronto. Antidepressants, the way they work is to sedate. You get slowing of the brain waves, you get a slight stimulating effect, you get sleep disturbances, you get sedation, you get drowsiness, you get cognitive impairment and uh, an increase in suicide attempts. Now, the slowing of the brain is why antidepressants have an antidepressing effect. They're slowing things down. It's exactly what Dave was talking about, that when he gets really depressed, he gets drunk, basically is what he was saying. A lot of people at Christmas time will get very blue around Christmas. They get drunk, fall asleep, and that's the end of the problem for them until they wake up. Now, if you look at the research on antidepressants, if they use an inert placebo as their control, and that's just like a sugar pill, mm -hmm. then the difference between placebo and the antidepressant is about 18%. If they use what's called an equipoise, that is an active placebo, that is a placebo that has some medication in it, not for antidepressant purposes, but f gives you a physiological reaction, there's no difference between antidepressant and an active placebo. Now, the good news about that is that tells us a tremendous amount about what the brain can do to correct depression. Right. That's the real value of that research. So if you get your mind around the fact that this is not a place I want to be, that what I want to do is I want to correct my own depressed mood states, the mind has enormous resources for helping you out of that. And throughout the program here, we'll be talking about a variety of different ways that folks can try to harness that very powerful, you can think of it as the shrink in your head, that the body is set up for its own psychotherapeutic processes. And if you engage those, they're extraordinarily powerful. And that's why we call this It's All in Your Head here on CFUN 1410 AM with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates. And the website is a great resource. Uh, you talk about all the different kind of issues that people have that are brain related. You can uh, read all about them at swingleandassociates.com. And uh, the telephone number at the clinic, by the way, is 608-0444. You could tell right away when you do a brain map whether somebody has taken antidepressants, can you tell in their brain mapping? In some of them you can, yes. There are very specific effects of some medications. You know, it's interesting. I had a friend who who's just moved away and started a new job and came back the other day and said, I'm just miserable. I'm alone. I'm starting a new thing. I don't know anybody. It's gloomy. And so went to the doctor and was prescribed antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the danger you were talking about is that you also then become reliant on that, thinking that if I don't take this, mm -hmm. I'm going to be miserable. That's right. And it becomes worse. You use more medication. It's a downhill spiral. It's interesting that you say that she felt isolated because one of the things that you find routinely with SAD, seasonal affective disorder, is a reduction in social contacts. 
So the first thing we can suggest to folks who find that they are affected by seasonal affective problem is, as we say, suit up and show up. Get out of bed and go down to your community center or go to the library or do anything, but get out and uh, get mingling around folks because it will have an antidepressant effect. And it's so easy when you're not feeling good to say, I don't want to go to that party. Absolutely. Yeah, And you know, and it's funny too, how many of those parties have lots of alcohol or mm -hmm. drugs as well? Dr. Paul Swingle is in the house. He's making a house call, and you get to listen to it uh, here at uh, It's All in Your Head. And we're talking about seasonal affective disorder, but we do invite you to call about any symptom or issue that uh, you may or a friend may be dealing with. And, uh, in fact, let's take a call. Liz has a question about Tourette syndrome. Uh, Liz, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle here on CFUN 1410 AM. Oh, hi there. I just wanted to ask, my son is eight years old, and progressively he's been having a lot more of those um, twitchy type of movements yes. and um, and sounds. No, I didn't get him actually um, uh, diagnosed by a doctor because they say a lot of the times it cannot be diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, do you deal with that at all? Yes, we see a lot of children with Tourette's. Is he on any medication? No, nothing. Oh, okay. Because one of the things we find if kids have ADD and they put them on methylphenidate or another stimulant, sometimes it precipitates Tourette's. There is a very straightforward procedure that we use for Tourette's, increasing a particular waveform called the sensory motor rhythm. And it's the same one that's used for the treatment of epilepsy. And it calms down the involuntary movement. It's difficult with young kids because sometimes it's not Tourette's, it's more of a behavioral thing. And you can see that with children who do eye blinking, for example, and they find that parents and teachers get upset by it. It starts to take on a life of its own. So the first order of business is to do a brain assessment, see what we're dealing with here. And if it is Tourette's or some other involuntary movement problem, usually it's that treatment that I just indicated. I see. And how long is that treatment? Usually about 10 sessions or so. It depends on what we're dealing with. <clears throat> Very often you'll get relief after a single session. We also do some other treatments along with that to, uh, again, calm the central nervous system. And are the treatments quite gentle or would he be freaked out about it? He'd love it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of kids in the clinic, that's for sure. That was the one thing actually that really impressed me, Liz, about being there is that is it's a very kid-friendly office and there are tons of kids. I mean, there were when I was there. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the number here. It's 608-0444. Uh, that's 608 608- 0444 and uh, can't thank you enough for calling and talking about your son there, Liz. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually went through the procedure myself because I'd never heard of it. So Dr. Swingle sat me down and he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a brain map. And after which you came back and you told me a whole bunch of very revealing things, true things. And it's funny because I used to be the kind of person that if something bad happened, I'd get into a funk and it was visible and people would see it. And uh, and I didn't even realize it was happening. I was a miserable person to work with for a large portion of my career. Maybe still am to a degree, as some people are saying on the other side of the glass. But it is amazing that since, and one of the things that was most affected was sleep. Uh, since then, no problems falling asleep, no problems staying asleep or falling back asleep. And I'm trying to remember the last time I've been in a funk. And you've been lovable. And I've been lovable, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about here. And you hit it on the head a moment ago when you said cancer of the mind, which is dwelling on those negative thoughts. And that was one of your first tips in the fight against seasonal affective disorder order is recognizing that and changing it. Yes. There are a number of other things that people can do. For example, one of the hypotheses about seasonal affective disorder is it's a serotonin problem. There are a couple of things that people can do at home without uh, getting an antidepressant. One is to increase carbohydrates. So uh, go out and have a spaghetti dinner and uh, see if you feel better. The nice thing about some of the things I'm going to suggest is you'll know in 48 hours if it's touching the problem for you. It's not like antidepressants where the therapeutic level in the blood takes about six weeks and all the other problems associated with it. The other thing is there's a, and unfortunately, I don't think it's legal in Canada. I think it's in the United States, L-tryptophan. 1,500 milligrams a day of L-tryptophan increases the serotonin, and that's been very useful in treatment of SAD. The other thing is melatonin, which is legal in Canada now. The problem with melatonin is people have been using it inappropriately. What it's designed to do is reset the circadian rhythm, that is the temperature clock in the body. 
when there's a deprivation of light, the rhythm gets offset and sleep gets disturbed, you become fatigued, and seasonal affective disorder is directly related to that. Now, I did some research on that about 20 years ago, in which we looked at internal temperature to determine whether we could change that with biofeedback. And we can modify the internal temperature with the biofeedback protocols. If you're working with something like melatonin, it's a question of when you take the melatonin. And what I would recommend is you get the three milligram tablet, cut it in fours, so that's 0.75 milligrams per quarter. Take one in the morning and one in the afternoon because some people respond better to the morning dose, some people respond better to the afternoon dose. Or you can do one morning, wait 24 hours, do one afternoon, wait 24 hours, and see which one is touching the problem for you. I know uh, one person that took too much and then she felt dopey all day and she was all, yeah. You can get a melatonin hangover. The big problem with melatonin is they prescribe too much. Three milligrams is much too much. By the way, how many turkeys do you have to eat to get 1,500 milligrams of uh, tryptophan? <laughs> Cause, well, if uh, your mind is set, all you have to do is look at one, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if you have a three milligram tablet of melatonin, <clears throat> cut it into four and take one in the morning and try one of those quarters in the afternoon. Great mm -hmm. advice. Uh, you're on with Dr. Uh, Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates, and we're talking about seasonal affective disorder. As far as you know, negative thinking goes and this cancer of the mind mm -hmm. that you talked about, uh, can that affect not just your mental health, but your actual health? Is there any proof that there is deficiencies in your immune system the way you think? Yes, <clears throat> there's no question about it. Depressed mood states, negative mood states, negative thoughts, decrease immune functioning, and there's pretty good evidence uh, associated with that. The other uh, treatment for SAD, by the way, one of the things that we should talk about is uh, what's considered the treatment of choice, and that's light therapy. The room illumination is about 100 looks, and a rainy day is about 2,000. Direct sunlight is about 10,000. So that'll give you an idea of the kind of problem when we have all of the cloudy days. The light therapy machines put out about 2,500 lux, and if you give yourself about an hour a day, just have it in the room while you're doing other things, a lot of people respond very favorably to that. About 70% respond positively to light therapy. Uh, now, the interesting thing is you don't have to be sitting there staring at it. You just have it in the environment. You can do things like get full-spectrum light bulbs, the light boxes. If you call the clinic, we can give you some advice on the types of units and things of that nature, but that can be extremely effective. Now, is that ultraviolet light that we're getting? I mean, no, it's, it's just not. full spectrum. Full spectrum. So it doesn't help your plants grow as well while you're while you're sitting in... Yeah, probably oh, would. It would help? <laughs> Again, there the issue is when do you uh, use it? About 53% of the people respond in the morning, about 32% midday, about 38% evening. So there again, you want to experiment, you know, try it in the morning, which is usually what's recommended, early morning. The other thing, of course, if you don't want to go out and buy a light box, get up at sunrise and go out and stand on your balcony because even on a rainy day, you're getting about 2,000 lux. The light therapy boxes are providing about 2,500. So, you know, just get up in your bathrobe and go out and stand on the patio and have your coffee out there. There's a lot of things that you can do, just positive attitude about, I'm going to take care of this problem and go and deal with it. And of course, the thing you're battling, though, is that when you're depressed, you have all sorts of weird sleep patterns. You don't want to get up out of bed. That's right. I don't want to do it because it won't work. I am Peter Shad, along with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates. We're talking seasonal affective disorder. And if you just joined us and you haven't heard Dr. Swingle before, he's a man who's devoted his life to unlocking the secrets and the power of the human brain. Christmas time, very different for very many different people and whoever you talk to some have wonderful experiences like me and it's a really magical time of year others uh, not so much there's a lot of factors involved in Christmas that could put people into a bad mood including sads but there's other things too isn't there oh absolutely we get a lot of folks who get down around Christmas time and that's more of a reactive depression as opposed to a seasonal depression they're reacting to some historical issue, a nemesis date, or feelings of being alone when everybody is focusing on family, things of that nature. And you get some interesting things. Some folks who have really good Christmases get depressed after Christmas, for example, you know, 
they tore down the circus tent, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. So you get a lot of that kind of reactive stuff. You never, ever want to medicate a reactive depression. Basically, you want to deal with it. And there are a lot of ways that we can help folks deal with depressed mood states. You combine Christmas with sad, and then you have a pretty potent combination. The way we uh, deal with this with neurotherapy is we look to any predisposing factors and correct those. About 80% of individuals who experience sad have a history of depressed mood states that are not related specifically to seasonal issues. So generally speaking, there's some predisposing factor. Even so, some of the things that I've been suggesting on the program can make a big difference in terms of helping a person motor through these times. We'll go over some of those again as well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, that during the holidays, there's so much about Christmas that you can actually help to medicate yourself. There's alcohol, mm -hmm. there's shopping, mm -hmm. and there's eating lots. You can satisfy temporarily yourself so easily during the holidays. Let's take a phone call. Lyle has a question about psychosis. Lyle, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head here on CFUN 1410 AM. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I take antipsychotic medication for psychosis. Yes. And often the, the side effects can be quite unbearable, sedation and acathesia and stuff like that. Just wondering if uh, neurotherapy is effective for treating that? Yes, we see a lot of conditions of psychosis. Again, the bottom line is find out what we're dealing with. And a lot of folks have the negative reaction to the antipsychotics like respiratol and so forth. Made him on that, yeah. Yeah, I assumed you were. That's one of the common ones that's used. The basic procedure here is instead of doing a rapid brain map, the one that Peter was talking about earlier, we would do a full map in which we look at all 19 sites because in psychosis we're concerned not only with one area of the brain not working efficiently, we're more concerned about brain site to brain site communication. And under those circumstances, we want to measure all 19 sites simultaneously to see how the brain is interacting with itself. And we uh, correct that with neurotherapy. Hey, Lyle, how long have you been on the medication for, if you don't mind my um, asking? About four or five years now. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty critical. Dr. Swingle says this a lot. You just can't go off of it right no. away. Yeah, I'm quite aware of that. I mean, there are benefits to having on the medication, but it's just kind of frustrating. The side effects can be unbearable. But I've listened to a meditation tape that kind of uses a metronome to kind of induce certain brain waves. And I'm wondering if meditation is a way of um, self-treating these conditions as well. Meditation can be very helpful. A lot of folks can't do it, though. Individuals who have very hyperactive mental states where they can't find peace in their own head do mind blank meditation for an hour a day. At the end of uh, a week, you feel like committing yourself. That's like uh, what Eckhart Tolle called the noisy mind. That's right, exactly. Hey, Lyle, here's the number for the clinic. Uh, Swingle and Associates at 604 608 0444. 608 0444. You'll be glad you called, and thank you for calling us and sharing with us as we go to Betty. Thank you for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head here on CFUN. Hi, thank you for answering my call. Uh, doctor, yes. you want, how do I turn off this negative record that's playing in my head forever? And now, is it negative about yourself? It's about myself, about things that hurt me 30 years ago. Yes, yes. Okay. This is exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about cancer of the mind. When you get these negative thoughts and they just take over everything. There are a couple of ways that we handle that. Whenever we're dealing with this kind of perseverative negative thought process, it's rather like obsessive compulsive disorder. And there's a specific area in the brain that we look at to see whether that area is hyperactive. And if it is, we correct it with neurotherapy. Then we have some other procedures that we use to basically reprogram the record. Nothing wrong with having a record playing in your head that says you're great and the world is wonderful. You know, like Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful <laughs> World. Uh -huh. Has it been really 30 years, Betty, that this has been happening? Oh, it's uh, many, many years. Actually, I've had eight of your treatments, doctor. Oh. I'm supposed to go back now for a recheck. Uh-huh. And the thing was I couldn't afford any more at the time. Basically, when we're dealing with that kind of uh, hyperactivity of that region in the brain, we're looking at 20, 25 sessions, which we probably indicated to you when you came in. 
And, uh, you know, the cost of it, this type of therapy is covered by some extended plans, but mm-hmm. tax deductible uh, for so tax deductible medical expense. Right. Betty, thank you for your phone call. In just a moment, when we continue our discussion about uh, seasonal affective disorder, I want to go over some of those things that you could do at home uh, that you gave us a little earlier on uh, about correcting uh, some of the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. And then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, neurotherapy and exactly what Dr. Swingle does at his clinic. In a couple of months, you're going to be having sort of an introduction to what neurotherapy does and cures in West Vancouver, I understand. Yes, there's a mental health association over there that has monthly lectures, and we're going to be offering a a lecture there on neurotherapy. So just uh, maybe check the office, uh, call at 6080444. And And we'll have it on the website within a day or two. Perfect. All right, so we've been talking all hour about seasonal affective disorder, and we just talked to Betty who who said that she's had 30 years of negative thoughts running through her head, and she said that after eight treatments she stopped. It takes a long time for some of these long-term issues, isn't it? Well, if you've had something going on for 30 years, there's a lot going on there, and uh, it takes a while to correct that kind of situation. But usually people have a uh, positive response within two or three sessions. It's not over then, but, you know, you know you're on the right track, which is, I think, essentially what she said. She's coming back for an assessment. And a little earlier in the show, we talked about what seasonal affective disorder is and how it's kind of manifested here, especially around mm-hmm. Christmas time, because there's so many other issues going on, family and mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And you talked about this cancer of the mind and negative thinking. How do you overcome that? Vigilance. <laughs> to recognize that you're in that state. Negative mind thoughts can be addictive. There are a lot of people who are addicted to resentment, and once they get started on a resentment or a negative thought, it overcomes them, and they uh, are focused on it during their entire waking period. Being vigilant of that and replacing that with positive thoughts in terms of the beauty around you or giving thanks or uh, anticipating some positive thing that's going to be taking place can make a huge difference in terms of just correcting the mental state. Incidentally, one of the things that they found with all of the therapies, light therapy, drug therapy, and so forth, is that cognitive behavior therapy, which is a psychotherapeutic procedure, markedly increases the effectiveness of things like light therapy and so forth. And individuals who don't respond, for example, to light therapy, 50% of those will respond positively to cognitive therapy. And what cognitive therapy does is change the way you think about yourself. That's it in a nutshell. You know, I used to look forward to, you know, when I wasn't feeling great, to watching the Canucks play. Uh That hasn't worked out so well in the last little while. (laughs) Um, Uh, You also talked about some dietary things that uh, were interesting for people like carbohydrates. So have a bowl of spaghetti and uh, and in a couple of days you should know if that maybe helps you. Yes, the uh, nice thing about the treatments you can do yourself for SAD is that you'll know instantly if it's doing anything for you. First of all, changing the way you're thinking, positive thoughts. The second is increased carbohydrates. The third is to play around with melatonin in terms of 0.75 milligrams in the morning and then try it in the afternoon. Light therapy, either getting up in the morning at sunrise and going out and standing on your balcony for a little while. Uh, or getting one of the light boxes or one of the full-spectrum light bulbs and trying that, you'll know in 24 hours if it's touching the problem. You also mentioned having a warm bath in the morning in the past episode. Yes. Again, said is a function of the circadian rhythm, which is the heat rhythm in the body. And a lot of people respond positively to a warm bath in the morning because it's um, shifting that uh, circadian rhythm. The other is an increase in omega-3 and you want it from fish sources, not the omega-3, 6, 9, and all that sort of business, just omega-3, compelling evidence that that's very positive in terms of positive mood state. So that's found in uh, fatty fish like salmon and tuna? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. And you I can have... get omega-3 supplements too. The sushi helps then, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you also mentioned the melatonin, uh, mm-hmm. and you, you get them in three milligrams? That's the standard dose that you find around, and it's much, much, much too much. You want to split it in four. L-tryptophan is uh, what's found in Turkey, but they haven't made the supplements here in Canada yet. Is it's that not idea? legal here. But uh, uh, 1,500 milligrams is what the usual daily dose. DHEA is another one that's been found to be very effective for depression. And again, it is not legal yet in Canada. And 90 milligrams a day of that is what the research dose is. 
earlier on you mentioned how latitude plays a huge part in those who suffer from seasonal affective disorder. So, of course, here in Canada, we're kind of prone to it. Yes. Once you, though, just determine that it's not just a seasonal issue and maybe you want to do more about it, they'd call your office, they'd come in for the initial brain map. Mm -hmm. How long does it usually take and, and what can people expect during that time? The actual uh, brain assessment is done in one visit so that by the end of the one hour, we'll know precisely what we're dealing with and what kind of treatments to use. People usually respond within a session or two in terms of improved sleep or whatever. A lot of uh, SAD doesn't reach clinical level. A lot of it is what we call sub-syndromal or subclinical, where you have some of the features of SAD, like poor motivation or just fatigued or just a bit glum, but that doesn't rise to the level of clinical depression. The same kind of treatments work in that regard as well. There's been some interesting research using light sources in workplaces, you know, like the light boxes, and it decreases lost days and things of that nature. And when you go on to determining exactly the extent of the depression or the extent of how serious or whether it was a trauma or whatnot, and then you go and basically uh, have people go through these treatments and just quickly explain the difference between uh, just a regular treatment and what a brain driver is. Yeah, the regular treatment, we set it up so that when the brain's doing what we want it to do, you'll hear a tone or see something move on a computer monitor, and it's biofeedback. You're making use of information that's telling you about a brain activity you couldn't possibly feel, but you make use of that information to learn how to self-regulate brain activity. If it's a child, we set it up so they're playing a video game with their brain. Brain drivers is a non-volitional technique in which uh, we measure brain activity based on that measurement on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. We stimulate with light, sound, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields, and so forth to nudge that area of the brain into more normative functioning. It's really quite relaxing. And one of the hardest things uh, while going through it is staying awake. You want people to be awake during the treatments, but I had a tough time because it's just so relaxing. Well, there are some treatments in which you actually can be asleep during the treatment. Uh, doctor, it's been a great year, and uh, I know that it must be very gratifying for you to have helped so many people this year, and uh, not only at the clinic but here on the air because you've answered an awful lot of phone calls, and uh, I guess that's one of the reasons why you do this job. That's right, absolutely. Absolutely. In the new year, we'll start off the new year with optimal performance. So uh, folks uh, want to uh, optimize their mental state and get on with things, just like the Italian soccer team. <laughs> That'll be the topic of January. Beautiful. Let new Year's resolutions. <laughs> let's give uh, the uh, digits again and the contact. Uh, swingleandassociates.com is Dr. Swingle's website. That's swingleandassociates.com, S-W-I-N-G-L-E and Associates. The telephone number at the clinic is 6080444. It's been a pleasure. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.